today we're going to talk about the value of love. I'm going to use for a basis 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the, the love chapter, often read at weddings and other uh, selective occasions. But before we jump into that, uh, anybody have any idea what is the most listened to love song in modern history? Yeah, uh, there's a lot to choose from. So I dove in and thought I would dig it out, and I discovered that uh, the song originally was, re was recorded by Dolly Parton in 1974, and she wrote it because she was breaking with her partner to do a solo career. And so she, uh, again, Porter Wagner was her partner, and she decided to go solo. So she wrote that song basically as a tribute to their, their partnership and their friendship over the years. And then, in, uh, I, I think it was later in, um, uh, uh, that another artist picked that same song up and did a soul version of that same song, and that one went viral. In other words, today, if you look up this song, you will find it has 1.3 billion views on YouTube. And after I watched it, it was 1.3 billion and one. The song is I Will Always Love You by Whitney Houston. That's the most listened to love song. And then I get interested in 55 of the saddest love songs that are written. <laughs> oh my goodness. That is pretty bad, isn't it? A sad love song is pretty sad, isn't it? Yeah, I would agree with that. Sometimes sad love songs uh, speak for us, not to us. But the number one of the 55 saddest love song is Adele's Someone Like You. Yeah, that is kind of a sad song. Today we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 13 and what God says about love and understand it from a, his viewpoint, not the viewpoint of the world. Number one, where does love come from? We're going to start at a very, very basic place. Where does love come from? Is love something that floats by like uh, on a river and if you don't reach out and grab it, you're, you're, you're doomed for life? Is that is that how love works? It's just kind of floating by and you have to reach out and grab it? Is, uh, love in, does love work in a way that, um, that we have some attraction within us? And if we don't act on that attraction, then we're just going to be unhappy for the rest of our life. Is that the way love works? Is love like a thermometer, depending upon what kind of a day we're having? We're having a good day, we're, in, we're, you know, we're loving and we're in love. We're having a bad day, we're not in love. It's terrible. Is that the way love works? Well, sometimes that's, uh, we make it out to be that way. You know, we have to reach out because it's floating by or some attraction we have to take hold of. Or if we're having a good day, we're in love. And if we're not, we're not. But that's not how God sees love. In um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I'm reading three verses out of that chapter to start with, the first three. But uh, in this chapter, there is um, 20 times love is either mentioned or referred to in 13 verses. 20 times in 13 verses. That's a lot of time for the word love referred to. Now, anybody know the book? That's chapter in the Bible where the love is mentioned the most time. Anybody know the book in the Bible where is mentioned the most? Which book gets the winner? John, which? First John, yes. You've got to qualify. First John, absolutely. First John 1, 2, and 3. That uh, book, uh, Love is Mentioned, 42 times in 1 John. So there's a lot of mention there as well. In fact, I'm going to read out of 1 John here of uh, where does love come from. 1 John 4, 8, and 9. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who has been born of God and knows God, whoever does not know God, uh, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. There you have it. Where does love come from? Love comes from God. As we uh, reflect on that, we see that this verse tells us that God is the basis of love. He created love. He created us then because we are in his image with the capacity to love in the way that he loves. We have that potential. We have that capacity. Now, if you've ever studied the idea of love and, and, you know, we have love languages that uh, we have to learn about our... What's going on here? Here we go. Uh, 
anyhow, I'll just keep flowing here. We'll see what happens. But I'm cutting out and cutting in. But uh, if you ever, you know, love languages that you learn to love uh, either your family or your spouse better. And, but there's also uh, words. We only have one word for English. So the word for love, we only have one in English. You know, you love your spouse, you love your kids, you love your cat, you love your car. It, it's all the same thing, love. But in, in the Greek language, you actually have four different ones. Someone says up to seven. I haven't really investigated, get, investigated that far. But the four words for love in Greek, I think, are helpful for us to understand. And the first one is agape. That's the highest love. That's imputed to us from God. Yeah, I didn't say imparted. I said imputed on purpose. Because imputed means that when it's given to us, it actually becomes ours. That's what it means. It's not separate from us. It becomes us. That's what the word imputed means. So when agape love comes inside of us, it's put into us like we uh, would, would take some kind of medicine or whatever that would get in our bloodstream and into our skin. That would be the idea of agape love. That it actually becomes us, but it doesn't start from us. It starts from God, and it's put into us, and then as it's into us, it begins to function as us. That's what agape love is. In fact, God says, I am comfortable with you calling me love. What's God like? God is love. God says, I'm comfortable with that. I, I, I'm okay with you. If you tell people what I'm like, that the first thing that you list is love. I'm good with that. Now, there's a lot of ways that we could describe God. We could describe him as holy. We could describe him as righteous. We could describe him as, as uh, you know, uh, just. There's a lot of ways that we could describe God. But God says, first and foremost, it's okay with me. In fact, I would like it if you would describe me as love. Now, if you were to, um, you know, somebody wanted to know uh, what I was like and you were describing me to somebody, the basic thing that you would say to that person describing me is to say, well, first and foremost, he's human. And then after that, I'm male. And then I'm a husband. And then I'm a father. And then I'm a pastor. You see, all those things get added on, but I'm very comfortable with you saying I'm human. <laughs> I, I'm, you know, I didn't come from an animal. I didn't come from an ape. I didn't come. I'm human. I was created human. That's who I am. I'm comfortable with that. And so God says that if you want to know him, the basic thing that we should connect with him is he's love. So it would be a great idea for us to understand what this love is, is all about and how it works and how we can receive it and walk in it. So that's agape love. Now, um, I am I'm under the, the opinion that if you and I want to receive from God this agape love, that we only get it through Jesus. In fact, I'm not, that's not my opinion. That's a fact. Many times in the Bible when it describes God's love, it says so because you have given your life to Jesus. In other words, outside of Jesus... We don't have access to agape love. We can't operate in agape love. However, I do believe that because we were created human or created in the image of God, these other three loves that I'm about to mention, that we can operate in those loves, but we can't operate in agape love. What's the first one? The first one is storge love, and that's family level love. That's natural birth. You know, we do anything for family, right? Because they're blood. We sacrifice for family. When there's an emergency, we throw everything aside and go be with family. When, when there's a crisis, what do we do? When somebody dies, we take off work because that's family. We, we, I mean, family's important to us. God put that in every human being regardless of whether or not Jesus is Lord of their lives. There's something within us that we, that we want to to, again, uh, be with family and take care of family and, 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 you know, be taken advantage of by family. I mean, it, it happens. But this family thing is strong love within us. The next love is friendship love. That's another level. And that's really based on interest. In other words, it, you, you are friends with somebody because you have something in common with them. 
And uh, I, I was uh, citing about Nick. He, he used to be a skater way back when. And so I'm sure when Nick was a, a skater guy with the skater pants and everything, you know, that, that he had skater friends. But when he left that interest behind, I don't know, maybe he still skates. I haven't checked in recently. He may be doing it behind the house. No, just kidding. Uh, it, the fact is that when he left those, that interest, he left those friends. And he got new friends. And then he was a chef for a while. He probably has chef friends. And then he was in auto parts for a while. He probably have auto parts friends. But now he's a pastor of a church, and he has pastor of a church friends. You see how that happens? Normally that you, not that, not that you don't relate to those people or see those people again, but you do, wherever your interests are, that's where your friends are. I mean, on the other way, if you were drunk, you probably had drunk friends. If you were a drug addict, you probably had drug addict friends. You know, it works that way. But as you leave those interests or those lifestyles, then you develop different friends. And that's the way it works. The world operates much the same way. And then finally, we have eros love, romantic, total preoccupation. I probably don't need to describe this one very much. But it's the fact that um, we just do unchar un uncharacteristic things of us because we're in love, Right? I met a girl in Utah, and I drove to uh, Louisville, Kentucky, one weekend from Virginia just to see her. That was really stupid. I mean, I looked back, I was like, what was I thinking? But I thought I was in love, all right? Just, you know, crazy stuff that we do. You go to the movies, and you only buy one seat for the theater because you want to sit together, right? That's being in love, right? That's just like, Wow. So, uh, eros love is, is something, again, uh, we see a, a lot in the world, but, um, and it, that's something that is within each one of us. Now, here's my point. My point is that when you get agape love, it actually encompasses all the other three, but it changes motivation. In other words, when you get agape love, you have family, you still have your family, but your family gets extended. Because now it's the body of Christ. Your family gets extended. And you actually sacrifice for other people that you're not related to because everybody is committed to Jesus. Your family is extended. You still have that natural. But now you have the, the spiritual family of God. You have friends. Not because you have common interests, but because you all love Jesus. And you can be, have different interests in mind, but you're friends together because everybody loves Jesus. And so he goes and takes these boundaries and expands them. And then eros love. I mean, you talk about God being passionate for us or jealous for us. He has eros love within him as a God. And when we go and stray, he wants to jump in and get our attention and bring us back. He is passionate about us, and so he has eros love as well. And again, that's expressed in the confines of husband and wife and between family is that eros love of God being passionate for those that he loves. So when we get agape, we still have all the other three, the friendship and the family and the, and the romantic love. We still have those, but they change and they expand and they're, they're different. They have a different motivation. It's no longer about self and what I can get for myself. It's about how I can bless for the glory of God. Whole different understanding. And yet the world operates in those lower levels because they don't know Jesus yet. And if they would, they would receive that agape love. Then all the other loves below them would change. All right, 1 Corinthians, here we go. 1 Corinthians, chapter 13, 1 through 3. I asked the question there, if love is missing, what do we have? If love is missing, what do we have? And I'm speaking about agape love here. Let me read it. Let's understand what's being said. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. In these three verses, we see what's missing 
if we don't have love. Verse 1 says this, I become nothing or I'm only. As we look at this, we, we, we realize that God is saying that even though we can speak different languages, maybe even the languages of angel or speak in tongues, you know, that that's kind of puffs us up. We are somebody. I really, I really think about that in relation to education. If I think about different languages, and some are given by the Spirit, but others that we learn, that we really think education. And, you know, we have letters after our names, and, and so we think we have more respect or we're more important because we got educated. And God says, you know what? You can be the most educated person in the world, but if you don't have love, guess what? You become nothing. Wow. That's not how we think in this world, but that's how God thinks. And so we're kind of lining up with how he thinks. How many of you remember the gong show? I'm dating me now, you know. I, I mentioned that maybe it's equivalent to America's Got Talent. People go, nah, it's not the same. <laughs> But basically, it was way back when, I don't know when the show was, but probably 70s or uh, 60s, well, I don't know, let's, let, let's not go there. But anyhow, they, they, people come out and perform, and they had this huge symbol up on the wall, and they take this big stick, if, they, if the, the, the performers didn't make it, and they gong that thing, and they, they were out, they were gone. I mean, it was like they couldn't perform anymore because they got gonged. God uses that analogy that if we don't have love, we might be educated, might know a lot of languages, but if we don't have love, he says, you're out. You're nothing. Let's go on here. The second thing in verse 2, he says, I have nothing. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge and have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing or I have nothing. What's happening here? Look at my gifts. Look at the abilities I have. Man, I've got faith. I've got, I've got knowledge. I, have, I, I can prophesy. It's all about the gift. But there's no love in it. What does God say? What do we have? Nothing. Oh, but you don't know the gift. It's from you, God. God says, yeah, it is from me. But where's the love coming with it? Wow. That's not how we think. You'd want a pastor that would have all those gifts to lead your church, right? I would think so. Yet, there's more to it than that. There's also the love. Well, let's try again. Verse 3. I profit nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing or I profit nothing. Wow, I can't educate myself enough to please God. I can't, I can't uh, develop my gifts enough to please God. Maybe I'll just sacrifice my socks off and get God's attention. He says, no, that doesn't work either. You can sacrifice as much as you want to. You can, you can give up Starbucks for a month and put that money in missions, and that still won't get my attention. Unless it's out of love, then it will. And so, it's not about the sacrifice unless the sacrifice is done in love. Agape love, then, is at the top, and it trickles down through all the others' love. The world can actually operate in the other three, but never in agape until they come to Jesus. Number three, why is love so important? Why is love so important? Paul finishes up this chapter in 1 Corinthians 13. that says, the greatest of these is love. He writes there... That these three remain, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. Why is agape love so important to God? Let's find out. There's three things that I think that, um, that would help us to understand why it's so important to God. First of all is that love equals life. Love equals life. Not just breathing, not just existing, but there's something that is life-giving and of life when you have Love at the basis. Here he writes in um, 1 John 4, 9, then 16. 9 says, This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. That we would be alive through him. Not just exist or breathe, but alive. And then verse 16 says, And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love 
lives in God and God in him. There you have it again. When you have love, agape love, you have life. You don't have agape love, you're just breathing, you're existing. But you don't have life according to God. You have bios life but not Zoe life. Zoe life is the God life that we get from God. When you know that you're loved, like from a father or mother, from a sibling, from a spouse, from those in the church, leader in the church, when you know that you're loved, that's life-giving, isn't it? Amen. It's life-giving when you know that you're loved. When you settled, when you, you're in a marriage, and you know that, not, not perfect, but you know that you're loved. There's something life-giving about that. And yet in this world, we're all inadequate in some way, shape, or form. And so it's important for each one of us to settle that God loves me no matter if anybody else does or not. And when you settle that, when you settle that God loves me, regardless of anybody else showing it around me, God loves me, wow, that is so powerful. You've got agape love operating in your life, and you have life coming out of you, even though everybody else is not showing it around you. That's what agape love is all about. I was uh, got the privilege of going and praying with a, a pastor in this area, Pastor Larry. Some of you know him. Uh, he was in the hospital for some weeks and about ready to pass, and yet uh, something changed. And he's home now, and several of us pastors went to gather around him and anoint him with oil and pray for him and had communion together. Well, we walked in the door, and I, I, wasn't, I didn't know what I would be expected to see, but uh, he looked terrible. But his spirit and soul were so alive. It was unbelievable. And he went on to share that during his stay in the hospital, at 3 o'clock in the morning, he woke up and he got visited by the Father. He said for 15 minutes, God was present in his room. And this is what the Father said. The Father said that I have given the name of Jesus on earth. And that name is above every other name. I created the name of Jesus for the earth. And I want you to let you know that any time you say the name of Jesus, I come and I'm there and I stay. Wow. Wow. Yeah, amen. That was powerful. He's on a medicine they sent him home with that drips into his body. He said the medical community claims that this medicine is keeping me alive for six months. But it's also the same medicine that will kill me in six months. I don't get that. But that's what he said. In other words, it's keeping me alive, but it's also killing me. And he said, I've made the decision. My wife and I are in agreement that we're coming off the medicine. We're going to do it slow, but we believe that visitation from the Lord was proof enough that I'm going to live and not die. Amen. Is that powerful? Wow. God's love coming through in an hour of need. And he's there. Wow. And we had a communion service. He led us in communion. <laughs> I'll never forget that one. That was great this morning, Chris, but that one with Pastor Larry, wow. Whew. That was phenomenal. Yeah. The second thing why love is so important is that love shows value. Love is not just equal to life, but it also shows value. 1 John 3.16 this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters as well. When you value something or somebody, you will spend a lot of money on them, won't you? Because you value them. That's what we do. When we value something, we, we give, we sacrifice, we spend. Sometimes what we don't have. You know, we take out credit because we love. And so we find that that, Jesus Christ, uh, God the Father, saw something in us that he valued. And he said, you know what? I'm going to do something about it. 
I value the human race that I created. Therefore, I'm going to do something about it. And I'm going to take my own son, part of myself, and I'm going to bring him down to earth. And I'm going to have him live a life that's exemplary and go to the cross and, and then die and raise again and release this agape love over my people that they can have it in, in a way that they've never been exposed to it before. Wow. I think of my friends Sam and Bev. They had a daughter that turned their back, her back on God for about 16 years, and then she returned and remained, remains. And he said, my wife and I watched her go through that 16 years making horrible decisions, and we emptied out our, bank, our savings account three times to save her because she made bad decisions. That's love. I'm not saying that every parent should do that. I'm just saying that they did it out of agape love because they knew God would replenish the savings. They did it because they loved their daughter. And she came back to the Lord, and she said the distinguishing factor of her coming back to the Lord and now staying and growing in the Lord is her parents' unwavering love. Yeah, that's good. That's agape love in action. Meets us where we're at. There's a cost. There's a, such a cost to this value. Romans 5, 8, and I'm going to read 6 through 8. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. Even for a good man, some might possibly die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That amazes me. In other words, Christ died for me before he knew that I would make the right decision to follow him. You and I don't do love that way. We want some kind of assurance that if we're going to love somebody, they're going to make the right decision, right? That's what's in us. We want to make sure, we want some guarantee that if we empty our savings account that they're going to come back to God as a result of that. But that's not how God operated. He said, I went ahead and did it for you. I went ahead and made agape love available to you before I had the assurance that you would change and follow me. You could continue in your sin and do what you want to do and live your selfish life, but I made provisions ahead of time before you were born. So that you could enter and receive agape love. Wow. That's powerful. But that's how God thinks. That's who he is. The third thing about why love is so important is love redeems. Wow, this is good. Love redeems. Galatians 4, 4 through 7 records. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons because you are his sons. God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts and his spirit calls out, Abba, Father, so that you are no longer a slave but a son. And since you are a son, God has also made you an heir. He's made you family. So powerful. There was a song that um, I several years ago was uh, kind of circulating. It was made popular by Matt Gilman. And the, the, one of the phrases is, the more I seek you, the more I find you. And the more I find you, the more I love you. And that's God. The more you seek him, the more you'll find him. And the more you find him, the more you'll love him. That's the agape love in action. 1 John 3, 1 says, How great is the love of the Father that he has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that they do not know him. Again, sometimes I think we as Christians project that the world should know these things and operate in these things. And the reality, they can't. They can't. They can if they receive Jesus, but they can't apart from Jesus. But there's levels that they can, but the highest level they can't. So how important is love? Without it, there's no value. There's no life. There's no redemption. So number four, 
Do I value love as God does? That's the question. It gets personal now. Do I value love as God does? 1 Corinthians 18, or 16 rather, 13 through 14, says this. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. And do everything with love. So Paul's finishing up his book, and he's given some one-liners here. And he starts out, and he says, be on guard. Meaning that there's something we have to guard that's valuable, and there's also an enemy that wants to steal it. So he says, be on guard. Stand firm in the faith. Now, this is important because sometimes there's a lot of people say, well, I have my faith, or that's a faith. But that's not what Paul talks about. He talks about the faith. And the faith is when Jesus is Lord, that we live for him, that we honor him. That's the faith. It's not my made-up faith. It's not your made-up faith. It's what God sent to us. It's the faith, not a faith or your faith or my faith, but the faith. He says, stand strong in that. And then he says, be courageous and strong. In other words, be secure in it, that you know who you are and whose you are, and then do everything with love. So these one-liners are coming out here. And I want to just submit to you four things that um, we would do to, to love or value love as God does. Number one is that we would take on the nature of a servant. That's what Jesus did. We should be serving him, and he's serving us. And so when we get agape love into our life, we start serving others when maybe they, we think they should be serving us, but we serve them. And we find that in Philippians chapter 2, 6 through 8, where it records, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. So when we receive and gain agape love, we'll start serving people, serving others. The second thing is to lay down our life for, life for a friend, to sacrifice for somebody else. Proverbs 17:17 17, 17 says, "A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity." John 15:13 through 16, "Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends, and you are my friends." If you do what I command, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned, I learned from my father and have made known to you. Jesus laid down his life so we could become friends. And we are called to do the same for one another. Not because we have to sacrifice, but because we love and it includes sacrifice. But it's always for a greater purpose. The third thing is to forgive what doesn't deserve to be. When agape love is an action, that means you forgive others for areas they don't even deserve to be forgiven for. And you may be reminded every day that you're in a situation because somebody else made a decision and put you in that situation. And you're there not because you want to, but it's care because you have to because somebody else made a decision for you. And we can build up, uh, we can harbor that and grudge that and build up an offense in our lives. And Jesus said when you have agape love, you can actually be free of all that and walk in freedom even though you stay in the same circumstances. That's agape love in action. When you're able to forgive people and they don't deserve being forgiven for what they did. The final thing is this, is to see in others what they can't see in themselves. This is agape love. Because God saw something in you that he reached out to you and made his understanding clear that God loves you and has called you and put gifts in you. He reached out and saw something in you that you maybe didn't see in yourself. And we do that today in the body of Christ. We see things in other people that they might not see in themselves, and yet we call it up and we call it out. And we say, man, you have that gift. You have that ability. You can do this far better than anybody else. Go for it. I support you. That should be what we champion in the body of Christ. And we see things in other people. The world says, get in competition and compete it out. And compare. The world says, compare. I'm better than you. You're better than me. No, that's not what happens in the kingdom of God. That's what the world does out there. We get in the kingdom of God and we champion each other. 
because we're full of agape love that he has poured forth in our hearts. John 13, 34, and 35, Jesus said this, The new command I give you, love one another, as I have loved you, so that you may love one another. And by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That's what Jesus did. He said, I saw something in you, and therefore I laid down my life so that you could experience that love. Agape love in action. I realize this message may be foundational, and yet it's very, very important for where we're going to next. Next Sunday, talking about the virtues of love. We'll get into real life settings and situations. But just a quick summary here, and that is, where does love come from? It comes from God. All of it. All of it. The eros, the, the, the storge, the phileo, the agape, all of it comes from God. And yet, being created in the image of God, we can operate at those three levels, but not agape. Agape only comes in Jesus. And when Jesus comes into our life, then all the other loves change below it. They have more meaning and they expand in ways that uh, aren't normal. But because agape love is in our midst, it happens if love is missing in our actions, what do we have? Nothing. We can be educated really well, and I love education. We can be gifted really well, and I love gifting. We can sacrifice really well, and I hate sacrificing. <laughs> but God says, if you do all those things without love, you have nothing. Yet with love, what do you have? You got education that brings life. You have gifting that blesses God and blesses people. And you, you have sacrifice that is meaningful. You're not doing it for you. You're doing it for God. With love, but without love, zero. Why is love so important? Because it equals life. It shows value and redeems everything. Wow. Wow. Do you value love as God does? If we do, we'll serve one another. We'll lay down our lives at times for each other. We will forgive other people for things they don't deserve to be forgiven for. And we'll see things in each other that sometimes we don't see in ourselves. Agape love in action. The value of love. And God says he wants all of us to know that when we're describing him to other people that have not met him yet, he says, the best term that I would like you to use is I'm love. Heavenly Father, thank you for Allowing us just to come into an understanding of love in a fresh way or even be reminded of what agape love is. That's okay as well. And I pray, Father, that if there's those in our midst that haven't experienced agape love through Jesus, that today they would commit their heart to say, I want to follow the example that God the Father sent to earth. I want to follow Jesus with my life. I want to turn my life over to Jesus. I want to receive that life you talk about, that redemption that you talked about, that value that you talked about. I want to receive that. Is that you today? If that's you, to say, that's what I want, that's what I've been looking for, just stick up your hand right now. Really, it's not as much for me to see as God to see. Anybody here today? All right. Okay. Good. Good. Father, thank you for those that desire to receive this life that has been discussed. And, and I pray, Jesus, that if they've lifted their hands to you, that you would come in and meet them. Meet them, God, in a fresh, brand new way that they've never experienced before. Wash them with your love. 
those of you that uh, raised your hand in a few moments is going to be folks here that are going to be praying and I really would encourage you if you raised your hand at the new start for Jesus either first time or second time just to come up and pray with these people to say you know what I just refreshed my life with Jesus first time or so just get up out of your seats and come up when these folks are here and just pray with them have a prayer with somebody before you leave just to settle that that would be awesome Give us an opportunity it's not a mandate but I really really would encourage that today Chris would you come